of a child, there is nothing more precious. Our Torah reading, our Haftorah today, was on the yearning of parents to become parents. The melody that Cantor Shula Kalir Merton just chanted has words Ulam Kulo Gesher Tsar Od the entire world is like a narrow bridge. The Vahaikar Lolafachet Klal, but most essentially, not to be afraid. The loss of a child can call into question one's faith. The loss, the premature death of a child can throw into havoc community and the sense of identity. That was the case in the Talmud. At the end of Masechet Chulin, a tractate of the Talmud that deals largely with issues of permitted and forbidden animals and how they are to be slaughtered, at the very end, the last page of Masechet Chulin, deals with a question. A person, this is the Mishnah, may not take a mother bird while on her young, even to purify a leper. If this is true for a minor law, how much more for a difficult command? You see, the law of kindness to animals Chapter 22 of Devarim says that if a, a mother bird is sitting on a nest, you cannot shoo away the mother to take the eggs. That for a mother to, in the immediacy of her presence, deprive her of her children, of her chicks, that is forbidden. And there's a reward offered in Deuteronomy. If you fulfill this commandment, you will have a long life. There is only one other commandment in the Torah with that reward. It is the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Kabed et avicha, vi'eti mecha, honor your father and your mother. Leman yemei yerechun, so that your years will be lengthened. Al hadama asher adonai notein Lach, that I, the Lord, give to you. And so right after that Mishnah in Chulin, the rabbis ask, what if, rabbis like what ifs, what if a father says to his son, climb this ladder to put back the chick in the nest to preserve it for its mother? And while climbing the ladder, the boy fell and died. 
how is that reward evident? How is it present? And Rabbi Yaakov says, it means the reward is not in this life, but in the world to come. Another rabbi says, stop at the hypotheticals. Who could imagine such a thing actually happening? To which Rabbi Yaakov says, I saw such a thing happen. Another rabbi says, well, maybe the ladder was rickety. Maybe it was a defective ladder. Because the rabbis have a principle, and that principle is one should not endanger oneself and expect God to intervene. If the ladder was defective, well, that's why he died. And therefore, that's why that reward wasn't fulfilled. And then they say, you know, Elisha ben Abuya, who was one of the most honored rabbis of his generation, a man who's quoted as saying that when you learn something when you're young, it's like chiseling it in stone, and when you learn it when you're old, it's like writing it in sand. <laughs> Elisha ben Abuya, some say, witnessed such a calamity and left Judaism. He then became known as Acher, the other one, the heretic. For Elisha ben Abuya, his understanding was literal. Others say in that same discussion that it wasn't just the death of that child, it was also the torture during the Bar Kokhba revolt of those who taught Torah that so revolted him. But Elisha ben Abuya, apparently, like others, took literally that statement of the Torah that if you obey my will, I will prevent, I will prevent famine, I will allow the rain to fall if you fulfill my commandments. And if you do not, I will stop up the heavens. You see, among our sages, how you read text differs. Not all sages agree as to whether you read something literally or metaphorically. When you read that commandment, honor your father and mother so your days will be lengthened, the rabbis will debate what that means. Some say it's a statement in the plural, to community, not to an individual. That when a society honors the older generations, that society has the moral qualities that will allow it to live. Others say it's not when it says a length of days, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. If you honor your parents, your children, will see you, and they will so honor you. And the quality of your life will be that of security and feeling loved, because you have demonstrated that quality. Some read the reward as the world to come. Others say it's not a quantity. Again, it's about the kind of life that you have. This last week, we lost a child in our community. Hillary Beth Moss passed away last Wednesday, a week ago. She was 16 years old. She was co-president of our USY. Many of you were at her funeral on Sunday of this week. There were 700 plus people at Harbor Lawn. Hillary was that rare soul who was a light to those who knew her. There is no medical clarity as to why she passed when she did. She had temperature on Tuesday, but not so severe that she couldn't go to school and take a test. 
She came home, took a nap, later called her friends, always with friends. Loved her friends. Her friends loved her. While she was still a sophomore the year ago, she was recognized as an exemplar of selflessness in Irvine and given an award that normally goes to a senior as a model of care. Beginning with her mitzvah project, she began to organize others, putting in over 100 hours a year of service to the larger community, especially Ronald McDonald House, where she would go to cook. Our USY was really at the center of her life, both locally and on the region. She went to bed not feeling well, but nothing extreme. And when the alarm went off on Wednesday morning, her father heard the alarm not being turned off. So Mitch went into the room to find his daughter not breathing. Doctors still don't know why. It takes your breath away. As extreme as the mystery of why, medically, even more is the extreme of the why, religiously. Why would a beautiful, loved, and loving young woman suddenly die? I felt I had to speak about it today because today we gather together with our machsors in hand and we speak of God as Hashofet Kol Haaretz, as the judge over the world. How would God choose for a beautiful, loving young person to die? How can we chant from our machzor and find it meaningful? How can we make sense of what it means to be a religious people? In a moment, in the repetition of the Musaf, we will chant, Unatana Tokef Kirushatayom. Let us speak of the sacred power of this day. Uveshofar Gadol Yitaka, and the great shofar will be blasted. The cold Mamadaka Yeshama. And the still small voice will be heard. Baro Shashana Yikatevun. On Rosh Hashanah it is written of a Yom Sokir Yechatemun, and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. Kama Yavrun Vechama Yebareun. How many will pass? How many will be born? Mi yechia umi amut, who will live and who will die? Mi vekitso umi velo bekitso, who will be cut down and who will not be cut down? Mi veesh umi vemayim, who by fire and who by water? Mi vecheruv umi vechaya, who by sword and who will live? Mi beraav umi vetsama, who from starvation and who from thirst? Uchuva, utfila, utstaka, ma'avin et roa hagzeira. But repentance and prayer and acts of kindness overcome the evil decree. One, this prayer, the Utana Tokef, which is the best known prayer to, for this day emphasizes that God is judge. What does that mean? What is clearly true is that none of us knows how much longer we have. As my beloved mother would say, we're here for a visit. All of us. And how and when, we don't know. And when we are aware of our own mortality, our own fragility, at its best, life becomes more precious, and we become more reflective of how to use the days that we have. 
In the Talmud, <clears throat> it says, Uchuva utfila utstaka ma'akreen et hagzeira. That repentance, prayer, kindness uproots that decree. But that's not how the rabbis wrote the Utana Tokef. They don't say it gets uprooted. Ma'avirin et roa hagzeira can be understood in two ways. It can be understood that it overcomes the evil decree. That's similar. But there is another reading, a reading that our sages, and sometimes it's temperamental and dispositional, read instead. And that is, it doesn't overcome the decree. It overcomes how you experience the harshness of the decree that at its best we choose in the face of tragedy how we will experience that tragedy. And that's what we have control over, not how long we live, how we will be cut down. What we have control over is the deeds of tshuva, which is self-reflection and reaching out to others to seek the making of stronger relationships. Tfilah is the self-reflection that links us to the perspective of a world, of God. And tzedakah is reaching out to do to the other, to care. I have a cousin who's like a brother to me. Lives in Boston. It's partly why I lived in Boston for six years, was to be close and to enjoy his company in law school, same law school he had attended. He and his wife had two boys, had. The younger of the two was feeling fluey in December. His wife was out of town visiting her parents. And so he called their local Harvard HMO for guidance. The nurse practitioner said, the flu is going around. Just keep your son hydrated, and if he's still sick in the morning, bring him in. So the boy went to the refrigerator, took more drinks, and didn't wake up was undiagnosed diabetes. It was at that funeral in December. The rabbi who conducted a friend said to me, you will never experience the coldness in your bones that you will experience at graveside. It will not only be that the earth is frozen, but you will feel that deep within you. No greater loss and the loss of a child. I was deeply shaken by it. We had Rabbi Harold Kushner here in the congregation just a month or two before. And Rabbi Harold Kushner, as many of you know, lost his son as well, his son Aaron, to a genetic defect called Pejeria. Pejeria is a rapid aging. A child normally doesn't live past the age of 12 or 13 as they shrivel. And he saw his son, this is Rabbi Kushner, and he said, I can need to pray. I need the comfort of God amidst this tragedy. But I can't pray to a God who would do this to my son. And so he wrote that book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And he chose to call it When and Not Why, because he said there is no answering the why. There is only how one responds when there is a tragedy, the when. And yet he addressed this issue of where is God in loss. And he said, I can believe that God is all caring. I can believe that God is all knowing, but I cannot believe that God chooses to be all powerful. We have in our Jewish mystical tradition 
the image that God chose to be less than all powerful to enable us our free choices to enable the world to exist I went to Elie Wiesel I was deeply shaken and I said to him what do you think of Harold Kushner's response to tragedy and he said it is not mine for me, he said, God is a question mark. I cannot say if God has chosen to limit God's power when and where. I also know and knew that Elie Wiesel said that anybody who explains the Holocaust as God's choice is speaking a blasphemy because we don't know what God chose there. And to claim one knows, he said, is to overreach. God is a question mark. What we do know is that people have power, and that if you have a rickety ladder, you can't rely on a miracle. And if people are rickety in spirit, they can cause enormous harm. I called a third sage. Rabbi Zalma Shachter Shalomi. He is a rabbi who, for the Jewish community, was the rabbi who was best known for being the interlocutor with the Dalai Lama in public settings. And I said to Reb Zalman, how do you deal with And he said, on four levels, as is our mystical tradition, on the physical level, I ask, what happened? The next level, beyond Asiyah Yitzirah, is the emotional level. I want to hold a family present. On the next level, the intellectual level, Bria, I can only go to where Kushner goes, and that's to acknowledge that bad things happen to good people, that God created a good world, but not a perfect world. People have free choice and use it poorly, and the body can be rickety. Even though it normally works well, it can fall apart too. And then he added, but there is a fourth level of absolute. And that level is one of mystery where one can get a glimpse of wholeness in the world, even amidst loss. You can't fully explain, but you can accept more fully when you have the sense that this is part of God's will beyond our knowledge. Twenty years ago, I was in shock. There was a two-year-old from our community who had had a stroke, who was intubated, being aided in breathing. And the mother turned to me and she said, if my son gets better, I'll never yell at him again. To which I replied, I hope Jacob gets better, and I hope you yell at him. I said that because I was concerned about her own guilt feelings. But it was more. I said, you know, in normal life, we overreact. That's what it means to be in a normal day-to-day -day life. In normal life, we yell sometimes. We wish we didn't, but we do. We're not perfect. We pray together for Jacob, and he got better, and I'm so grateful he did. There is mystery to life to know if the prayer and how the prayer made a difference, clearly made a difference for the parents, giving them hope that was fulfilled when we pray, we pray from a place of our fragility. We pray from the awareness that we're here for a visit and we cannot control all in our life. When I pray, I seek to open my heart to the deepest part of me, the part through which that still small voice flows that beckons me to be strong 
in the face of adversity. That part of me that beckons me to trust when there is uncertainty. That part of me that allows me to be vulnerable when I would wish to be guarded. That part of me that allows me to see and feel and hear the needs of others rather than to be closed off. Prayer at its best is lehit palel, to judge ourselves, to know we could be more. Call ha'ulam kulo, gesher tsar ma'od. The entire world is a narrow bridge. We must in life proceed with caution. It is dangerous. Life is uncertain. Those were the teachings of the grand, great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav. V'ha'ikar lo lefached klal, but we can't live with fear. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a subsequent book, and he called it Thou Shall Not Fear. He says the most repeated line in the Torah is you shall not be afraid. In this last week, I and we have had the, narrow, the air knocked out of us with the passing of Chaya Bina, Hillary Beth. And I have been so moved by our community of care, by those who reached out as teenagers and put their arms around each other the night that she was in the ICU singing together in our Family Life Center on Wednesday night. So moved by their love of each other and their love of Hillary and their love of our tradition, finding the words and song from our legacy to find their comfort and more, their strength, and their parents, who reached out to support their children and the parents who reached out to help Nancy and Mitch and Shannon and Tyler know that we care. There's much work yet ahead. They have a journey. We all have a journey of making sense of that which makes no sense, but not making sense, rather choosing to put one foot in front of the other, and to choose life. Uva harta b'chayim. That's the wisdom of our tradition, a people who has known suffering and loss, is we choose life. And so we gather today on a holy day, a day set apart to elevate ourselves with words of the past, with songs and melodies that open our hearts, the sound of the shofar that calls on us to be more present. We gather together heirs of a richness of spiritual wisdom. Call haulam kulo gesher tsar ma'od. This world is a narrow bridge. V'ha'ikar lo lefached klal. But we must essentially, must not be afraid. Ribbono Shalom, Master of the Universe, there are many ways to read the words in the machzor that we hold. There are ways to read it for each of us that hold true with our life experiences. There are ways in which the melodies we chant together link us to generations before and God willing to generations yet to come, for we are your people. We are a people among many of peoples that you have created. May we celebrate life each day as a present. Amen. Gesher tsar me'od, kol haolam kulo. Gesher tsar me'od, gesher tsar me'od. Ve'ha'ikar, ve'ha'ikar, lo'ha'ikar.
פחד כלל, והעיקר, והעיקר, לא לפחד כלל. כל העולם כולו גשר צר מאוד, גשר צר מאוד. Yes, it's hard to know.